with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. We're going to look at verses 1 through 9. Well, we're going to try. Uh, you know, I said try because I want to be invited back. See, so I, I don't want to be, oh, there's that Pastor Tony guy. He's going, to oh, my goodness, I'm not going, you know. So we're going to have some fun. We're going to laugh. We're going to get our toes stepped on. So hopefully you got some steel toes, shoe on, shoes on. So, but if you got open toe, you, it's going to really hurt. But um, we're going to have some fun and see what God has to say to us. Father, thank you for this great honor and privilege uh, to be here, Lord. Thank you for your grace and mercy. Lord, I pray that you would take the coals from the altar and touch my lips. Lord, that I may speak the oracles of God, speak your heart to the hearts of your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Acts chapter 13, looking at verses 1 through 9, the title of this message is very applicable, especially for today being Mission Sunday. The title of this message is, It's Time to Go. It's time to go. Now, we didn't work this out, Pastor Jeff and I. We didn't say, okay, now you're coming on mission. We make sure you get a title and a message. No, it's just the Lord. It's time to go. You say, it's time to go where? Wherever it is, God is calling you to go. The time of sitting in a church pew is over. It's over. Many of you have been sitting in church pews for years, and you haven't done anything for the Lord. Not one thing. You will give 60 or 70 hours to a job, but then come in church and just sit. You will give 60 or 70 hours a week to a job for 30, 40, 50 years. And they give you a silly little wristwatch and send you off and get the next person. And you're coming to a church that is eternal, dealing with eternal things, and you would just sit. God supplies for every church with the people who call it their church. There should never be a time that a church should ever have to borrow money from a secular bank to do God's work. I'm always embarrassed whenever we have to go to a bank and say, oh, can you please give us some money so we can do God's work? Last time I checked, God wasn't broke. <laughs> That's the last time I checked. Maybe you know something different. God isn't broke. He's not teetering on bankruptcy. The last time I checked, he said, a cattle on a thousand hills belong to him. He said, all the silver and all the gold are his. Amen. But the reason why churches have to do that is because people like you refuse to do what you're supposed to be doing. And it's unfortunate that many of you have become professional Bible study attenders. This, this is a great church, a legacy that was left from Pastor Steve Mays, now Pastor Jeff, feeding you the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, book by book. And you come and you take it in Sunday mornings, you come take it in Sunday nights, Thursdays. You just, you just fat off the Word. You know what you remind me of? You know, when I was growing up, you know, those who were my age and older, you remember when, especially the little boys, you know, when they, we're eating little, little too many, few too many uh, little Debbies and, and Ho-Hos. <laughs> you, you had to shop in the Husky section. <laughs> and the little girl, when she was eating too many, you know, Ding-Dongs and Ho-Hos and stuff like that, she, had, she was in the Chubbies section. That's so politically incorrect today, but, but that's what it was in my day. But you know what? Many of you, many of you are spiritually chubby. You're a spiritual little Husky guy. Spiritually, you that way. It reminds me of, you know, when we go to the buffet and they, they have to just roll us out the buffet because we feel we got we to gotta eat. We, we, we paid for this, so we got to eat uh, to get our money's worth. And then they roll you out. You just don't know when you leave here from church 
And you say, oh, the usher, they're so nice, they're opening up both doors. That's because they have to spiritually roll you out of here. <laughs> and you're just a chubby, a spiritual little fatty. That's what you are. You just go to all the Bible studies and just take it all in. Great church like this. And you do nothing. You do nothing to work it off. It's time to get out. You see, if you are a believer, if you've been born again, God has given every born again believer at least one gift to be used for the glory of God. If I were to take a survey and I would go and, and say, okay, you stand up. Tell me where you're serving here at this church. What would you say? Would you try to hide behind that pole like... You remember in school when you didn't want the teacher to pick you, you hide behind the person's head in front of you? <laughs> Is that what you would do? Is that how, what are you serving here? How are you working off all this good food you, you're being fed Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, Wednesdays, Thursdays? What, not counting your own personal feeding time. Where are you serving? Or are you one of those spiritual fatties that just come and sit and just take in more food, more food, just more of it? See, that, that's the temptation of being in a great church like this. You can become spiritually lazy where you just, you're okay with just taking in another meal, another sermon, another, and you're okay with that. God is speaking to some people today. It's time to get up out of this seat, this church pew. Stop fooling around. Giving your life to that. Which one you want to do? I remember hearing the story of Pastor Chuck. Pastor Chuck was going, was going to be a doctor. And God said, what do you want to do? Do you want to do that which is temporal? Or you want to get involved with those things that are eternal? Because when you help somebody as a doctor, you will help them only for a time. But there's a disease killing people for all eternity, and the disease is called sin. And you can affect people's lives for all eternity. And Pastor Chuck said, sign me up. Are you going to ask to be signed up? Isn't it time for you to just come and sit in a church chair? Is that what life is about? You wake up, go to a job, you get, deal with husband and wife issues and kids issues. You come in church whenever it's convenient. I remember doing a message that rocked a lot of people. It was called Convenient Christianity. People only come to church when it's convenient. When the kids don't have some sporting event. When, there's no, when, when family is not in town. I don't know where we get when family come in town that, that's, that we can have an excuse to miss church. I don't know where we get that from. Where do we get that from? It's not like you're in church all day. Not like the churches some of us grew up in. You're in church from 9.30, Sunday school, you don't get out to about three. You, you gotta bring a picnic lunch, feed the kids snacks and fruit snacks and juice bottles and carrying on. Cause you're in church all day. This is not this kind of church. Oh, boy, I tell you, I feel set free this third service. I'm telling you. I, I didn't say none of this stuff in the first and second service. I was hemmed up by the time. But here, so here it is. I'm free. I'm set free now. I'm set free. I'm set free. You say, oh, I came to third service. Yeah, you came to third service. The service, I'm set free. <laughs> So it's time to go. It really is. And we're going to see that God's going to send a couple of guys off. And God is going to tell them that it's time to go. So let's dive right in. Look what it says there in, in verse 1. It says, now in the church that was at Antioch, there was a certain, uh, certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetron and Saul. There was a great work that took place in the city of Antioch. The apostles in Jerusalem sent Barnabas up 
to check on this great work. And God started to do an explosive work, so much so that he went and got his buddy Saul that was exiled in his hometown of Tarsus and said, man, you got to come down here and help me with these folks. So he comes down and now a church is being established. One of the things that a good church must have at its foundation is godly leaders. Everything stands and falls on leadership. And so because God is establishing a great church in Antioch, he lets us know the people that he used in the leadership role. He said that there were prophets and teachers. The prophets were used to foretell the heart of God to the people of God. Sometimes they will also foretell future events. Like in the case of Agabus in um, Acts chapter 11, right around verse 28 or so, Agabus prophesied that there was going to be a famine in the days of Claudius Caesar, and it took place. So not only were there uh, prophets to give the heart of God to the people, there were also teachers. The teachers explained the prophetic message to the people, explained it in detail. That's what teachers do. And I, I tell you, I've been around a little while, been in ministry like Pastor Jeff over three decades. I've seen a lot. I believe the church, big C, corporate church, the church has been preached to death. Been preached to death. And as I look around, some of you came out of churches that I came out of, and there was a lot of preaching. And it was loud, and it was, and God said, ha! And it was loud and, you know, he'll pace the floor, sometimes walk on the pews and just, and just go for it. And you were excited and you leave out here and say, oh, that was an exciting service. What did he talk about? I don't know, but I was excited. <laughs> Some of you came out of those churches. And there was a lot of excitement. But here's the thing. Preaching, don't miss this. Preaching is for the unbeliever, teaching is for the believer. When you preach, you're proclaiming the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what you're doing, you're proclaiming. Now, once you have accepted that, you repented of your sins and accepted what Christ did for you on Calvary's cross, now you need to be taught how to live for him. And this is why a lot of people who call themselves Christians, they are not living for God. You know why? They've never been taught how. That's why I said the greatest need in the church is teaching. They've never been taught how. They never, like uh, Hebrews 6 said, they never go on to maturity. Watch this. This is what happens. Let's say you're in the church that is preaching, and it's preaching. You're preaching about the death burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's say all of a sudden you're like, you know what? Yeah, I need to repent of my sins. I accept Christ. Let's say you come back the next Sunday. You get more preaching. The following Sunday, you get more preaching. And then this is what happens. You think you need to come forward and get saved all over again because you sinned. And you think you need to get, to, and then there are several people who have been saved all I get, so I, I remember somebody telling me, I get saved every week. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean you get saved every week? Because they're not teaching. I'm preaching to the choir at a church like this because this is a great church that's teaching you through the word of God, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, book by book. However, many of you came out of churches that you know exactly what I'm talking about. And the teaching isn't there. I remember when I first heard the teaching of, of Calvary Chapel, I was, I was in the Marine Corps. And I used to listen to K-Wave going up and down the five freeway when I was at Camp Pendleton. And, and I was like, I was like, I never heard stuff like this before. I said, now keep in mind, I was an assistant pastor at a, at a, at a Pentecostal church at the time. I never heard teaching like this. I said, what is this? I remember uh, right when I spoke at, I had the honor to speak uh, at uh, Pastor Greg Glory's church. 
I remember telling him, I said, you know what, back in the 80s, you were given a message. I'm going to tell you the message you were given. You were given a message in James chapter 3 on the power of the tongue. And I said, I was on the 5 freeway. I had to pull off on the side of the road to take notes because I said, I'd never heard this stuff in my life. He was blown away by it because I was. Teaching is what's needed. We need to be taught how to live for God, how to walk with God, how to talk with God. We need to be taught how. It's like a new baby. We, 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 we say we're born again. If we're born again, then we're like a little baby. A baby needs to be fed and nurtured and take care of. And we make a mess and need our diapers changed and all kind of stuff. We need to be taught how. And this is the greatest need. And therefore, because it's the greatest need, this is what was given to the church in Antioch. To show you, God told Moses, say, hey, here are the Ten Commandments. Now go down there and teach these to the people. Jesus said, Jesus <laughs> said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all things I've said unto you. If this is God's word from Genesis to Revelation, then we need to teach it all. I'm preaching to the choir. You guys getting it. You're getting it. But there are many churches that's out there right now that's not doing this. It's not doing it. I just think this is just the way to do it. Now, there are other churches that think you ought to do things a little bit differently. That's okay. But this is the way we do it. You need to be taught the word of God. So there are prophets and teachers. And then the spirit of God inspired Luke, the author, to give us the names of these leaders. There was Barnabas. Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius, Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetron, and Saul. Let's start with Barnabas. Barnabas, did you know, according to uh, Acts 4.36, did you know that his name, was, his real name is Joseph? You know, you thought it was Barnabas. No, his real name is Joseph. Barnabas means son of encouragement. Because every time you were around him, he just encouraged you. They said, man, yeah, we know your name, Joseph. We ain't calling you that anymore. Man, you Barney. You Barnabas. <laughs> we might slip up and call you Barney for short, but your name is Barnabas because you always encourage us whenever you are around. Oh, I got to ask you, are you a Barnabas to the people you're around? Yep. Let me ask you this, wives. Are you a Barnabas to your husband? Or do you only complain about him? How he leaves the toilet seat up. And you got curlers and rollers and eyelashes and makeup and hair gel and hairsprays and all kinds of stuff all over the place. But you complain about he left the toilet seat up. Really? <laughs> Wigs and curls and uh, all kind of mess all over the place, all over the floor. And you going to talk about he left the toilet seat up. I'm looking at you like, Really? Is that what you're going to complain about? Are you a Barnabas? Parents, are you a Barnabas to your children? Or do you only complain about them? And I know some of you, I'm looking at you now. I know your culture. We have a church where over 30 different countries in attendance at our church. Meaning that our church look, you know, a lot like this. So I know your culture. Do you only point out the, the great, hey, they got all A's and the C, and all you see is that C. Look at this C. Your brother never got a C. Why are you getting a C? Oh, what do you see? You got a D? D is for dummies. <laughs> are you a dummy? You don't see those other A's there? See, your, your culture calls you to put that kind of mess on your kids. And I'm here to tell you, I'm your friend. I came all the way from, to, uh, from Virginia to tell you, hey, that's not right. Got to be a Barnabas to your children. Encourage them. Encourage them. People love to be around a Barnabas. They just want to be around you. Are you a Barnabas or are you a Debbie Downer? <laughs> Every time you come around, people leave you like this. <laughs> Man. I can't believe it, man. <laughs> or are you like pig pen? You just kick up a bunch of dust. It, 
if, if, you, if you're under 30, Google, Google pig pen. He's the guy with a lot of dust, peanuts, Charlie Brown. Okay. Do you kick up a bunch of dust whenever you're around? Just kick up mess. Strive to be a Barnabas. Strive to be a Barnabas. That can start today. Did you know that? It really can. So not only was Barnabas there, it was Simeon who was called Niger. Now, Niger is Latin for black. It means that he, he was from Africa. And many scholars believe that this is the same Simeon that carried the cross of Jesus in Luke 23, around, around verse 26 or so, that this is the same Simeon. That, and that Simeon was from Cyrene. Why is that interesting? Because the next guy, Lucius of Cyrene. It, it, this is what some people believe. Some scholars believe that what happened is that when Simeon had that encounter with Jesus, it affected him so much that he went back home to Cyrene and got his boy, Lucius, and told him about his encounter with Jesus. Did you know that there's a Lucius waiting on you tomorrow at the work to tell them about your encounter with Jesus today? They're waiting on you. Maybe Lucius is a neighbor. They're waiting on you. You know that neighbor you barely talk to? That neighbor that can barely get a wave out of you? There's a Lucius waiting on you to tell them about your encounter with Jesus. And next thing you know, they could be serving here in ministry with you. Serving as an usher, as a greeter, security, children's ministry, youth. Maybe going on a mission trip with you. That's what happened here. Not only was it uh, Lucius of Cyrene part of the leadership, Mannion, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetron. Now, I got to deal with the word Tetron. Tetron means one-fourth. When Herod the Great died, his kingdom was divided up into four parts. Each son had a part, one-fourth of the kingdom. One-fourth is the word for Tetron. So here it is, Herod the Tetron. And Mannion, who had been brought up with. You see that phrase? Who had been brought up with. Sumtrophos is the Greek word for that whole phrase. And it means, it can be translated as foster brother. You say, well, okay, so what? What's the big deal? It, mean, it means that Mannion was brought up in the home of Herod the Great and Herod Antipas, the one who beheaded John the Baptist. Now, why is that important? Because uh, history says that Herod is safer being Herod's pig than being his son. Herod the Great was a murderous individual, and all his children were murderous people. And Mannion was brought up in that house, and God took him and plucked him out and saved him. Maybe you, brought, were, maybe you were brought up in a mur murderous kind of house as well, angry house, a vile house, a wicked house. And out of all of your relatives, God has saved you. He plucked you out. You know why he did that? Because he loves your family. And he wants to use you to reach them. But what happens so often is when we've been walking with God for a little while, watch this. Our noses. <laughs> and you begin to look down on those poor peasant family members. <laughs> Wicked, vile people. <laughs> and then you go to the family reunions and you sit there with your little leg crossed and your foot dangling, <laughs> sipping your tea. And someone, family member comes over, oh, you know, they smoking. Hey, I haven't seen you in a long time. And then you're like, oh, please get that. Can you put that out? <laughs> These lungs are too holy <laughs> to breathe such vile tobacco smoke. Then another family member comes, and all of a sudden they go, and they go, oh, it's good to see you. And they're using four-letter words and cursing, and you're like, oh, <laughs> my ears. Can you please refrain from using such language? 
used to smoke a pack a day and you cursed like a sailor. Now God didn't save you. Some of you still cussing. That was free there. God never saved us. So we think we're too good. He saved us because he wants to reach that family, those old classmates, that neighbor. He saved you so you can be one beggar telling another beggar where you found bread. That's what he saved us for. So Mannion, who had been brought up in Herod, uh, with Herod the Tetron, and Saul. We know Saul later became the Apostle Paul who wrote one-third of our New Testament. We know that. And hopefully I can get to that in verse 9. Now, <laughs> verse 2 says, and they ministered to the Lord and fasted. Stop right there. Notice I want to bring to your attention the phrase, they ministered to the Lord and not for the Lord. Pastor Tony, Pastor Jeff, give me something to do for the Lord. No, 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 no. All ministry and service is for an audience of one. It's for Jesus Christ. The Bible says doing service as unto the Lord and not unto man, Ephesians uh, 6, 9 or so. I'm teaching right now for an audience of one. And you happen to be eavesdropping on my conversation with him. And you're being blessed. All ministry is to the Lord. Notice it didn't say to the people. See, if you're ministering for people, Paul said, hey, you know, if, if, if I'm doing it for people, then I'm no longer a, ser a servant of Christ. Now I'm a servant of the people. So if you're doing ministry for people, then, you know, what happened is this. You'll be tempted to compromise. Hey, Pastor Tony, guess what? I heard that so-and-so is going to be at the church today. Oh, really? Oh, let me, oh, I better not say that. I better not say that. Oh, is, will they really be here? Oh, let me put this in my notes. <laughs> See, you'll be tempted to compromise if you're doing it for people. But he said, ministering to the Lord and notice, and fasting. Minister to the Lord and fasting. Fasting is denying the physical so you can focus and concentrate on the spiritual. Fasting, don't miss this. Fasting, put your ears on. Fasting, I need you to hear this. Fasting, biblical fasting, is always connected to food. Why do I say that? Because I hear many of you, well, I'm fasting from social media. No, you're not fasting from social media. You're taking a well-needed break from social media, <laughs> but that's not fasting. Fasting is always associated with food. Food. See, you're denying the physical. All the flesh wants to do is three things, eat, sleep, and have sex. That's all the flesh wants to do. <laughs> That's it. So when you tell the flesh no, it gives you the strength and the power to say no when you're faced with temptation. That's what fasting does. It gives us the power. Why, why is it that you think that Satan doesn't want us to fast? Why is it that as soon as you say, okay, all right, I'm, go I'm going to fast for one meal, you would think that you haven't eaten for three months. <laughs> Stomach growling, just carrying on. And we need to fast and give our digestive system a break. We need to. But fasting is always associated with food. So they ministered to the Lord, notice, and fasting then the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Notice, I want to bring to your attention the word now. Now separate. It seems to be an urgency in the command of the Lord. Now, now, right now. Do not delay. Right now, separate Barnabas and Saul for the work I've called them to do. Right now. There's an urgency. When, it, when should they go? Now. When is the time? Now. Should we delay? No, now. Now, I had to pause there because I know some of you here, you're probably hitting your husband and say, I told you, 
the time is now to leave California. <laughs> now, you heard Pastor Tony, it's an urgency. We got to leave, it's now. I told you we got to put the for sale sign in the yard, honey. We got to put it now. Put in your two weeks notice now. Pastor Tony said the urgency is now. Whoa, pump your brakes. <laughs> because notice the Holy Spirit spoke and gave them this urgent command after they ministered to the Lord and fasted and prayed. You better not go get any truck from the U-Haul place, put any sign in your yard, Put in your two weeks notice until you can say you ministered to the Lord and fasted and prayed. The urgency came, the now came after they ministered to the Lord and fasted and prayed. If you haven't spent one second fasting and praying, if you're not ministering to the Lord in any kind of way, you better leave that truck in the U-Haul yard and you better not put that sign in the, uh, your yard and you better not put in your two weeks notice tomorrow. Better not. But Pastor, you said the, the time is now. Yes, for those who minister to the Lord and fast and pray. If you're not doing that, you better not. Holy Spirit ain't speaking that to you. Because the Holy Spirit spoke when they ministered to the Lord and fasted and prayed. That's when the Holy Spirit spoke. Now, how did the Spirit of God speak? Was it like, hey, stop fasting and praying. I'm about to speak. All right. Now, separate unto me. No. God spoke. Through the prophets in verse 1. That's how God spoke. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble because I see a big sign, a big, big letter numbers in the back wall. They didn't have that up before, but so they're saying, bro, you, you need to start. Okay, all right, I'm all right. Okay, I'm going to be okay. <sighs> I'm taking a deep breath. So now separate to me Paul and Barnabas for the work which I have called them to. And then verse 3 says, having fasted and prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them away. And so they fastened and prayed, they laid their hands on them, which was confirming what God was already doing, and sent them away. And so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in uh, Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Now, Here's the thing. I'm not going to give you all the distance between Cyprus and all that stuff. I'm going to spare you all that because I'm already out of time. I'm on borrowed time right now. Now, here's the thing I want to bring to your attention. The, they go out on their first missionary journey, and the first place they go to was Cyprus. Now, out of all the places to go to, why would they go to Cyprus? We know from Acts 4.36, Barnabas was from Cyprus. You say, well, so what? Watch this. Barnabas knew he had to first learn how to be a missionary at home before he ever tried to be a missionary across the water. Ministry starts at home. First Timothy 3, verses 4 and 5, it says, if a man doesn't know how to take care of his own house, how can he take care of the house of God? It's a rhetorical question, meaning that he can't. The, the thing is, a person that's called to be a pastor must be a pastor at home first before he ever be a pastor at church. You know why? Because if he's only a pastor at church and not one at home, when his family comes and sees him ministering, they despise his ministry. So he had to first learn how to be a missionary at home before he first learned how to be a missionary anywhere else. Oh, the same goes for you. I don't care what it is you're doing. Let's say you're an usher. And you come here and you're like, oh, welcome to Calvary Chapel South Bay. Hey, here's the bulletin. Hey, well, uh, would you like to say, hey, here's a seat right here. Come right. Oh, yeah. Can you scoot over a little bit? Just, just. And you just. And you get home. Get out of the way. You know, you know, you know, I'm a, hey, you over there. You, you know. And your family see you here at church. Being this usher at church. And see you being a grump at home. Well, ladies, it goes for you, too. You, you're serving the people. And you're, just, you're serving the people. Oh, here, you want a little more? Oh, here's a little more for you. And serving you help them stand late, cleaning up and all this stuff. You get home. Your husband says, honey, can you bring me a sandwich? Get, I only have two hands. What do you think this is? You get it yourself. You got some legs. 
And the husband was like, I just wanted a sandwich. And you must learn whatever it is you're doing to be that at home first before you ever try to be that here. Because your family is watching you. And if you're not that at home, they'd despise your ministry. So this is why he went to Cyprus. Look what he says there now in verse 6. Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Now, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm going to leave out a whole bunch because I don't have that time. I'm already on grace time right now. But let me just say this. Here it is, the proconsul. Sergius Paulus, is believed to have been the governor of Cyprus. And here it is, Bar-Jesus, a false prophet, a sorcerer, who was seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Don't miss this point, especially for you Californians here. Anytime anyone is in charge of making laws, of making decisions that affect the state, Satan will always send them a bar Jesus to turn them away from anything that is godly. You need to look past. You need to look past the physical, the flesh. Look past that and see Satan working behind the scenes. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. I constantly hear Californians, since I've been out, out here, talking about what the governor is doing and the decisions he's making or not making, and you don't know there's a bar Jesus behind the scenes seeking to turn him away from the faith or anything that is godly or anything that is right. I'm not shocked by any laws being passed in any state or our wonderful nation. I am not shocked that anything ungodly, uh, 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 not spiritual, or all this sort of stuff, I'm not shocked because I know Satan always sends a bar Jesus to turn them away from anything that is godly. And this is why we as believers are called to obey 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you, it says, the supplication, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority. We're called to pray for those in authority. And I just wonder, do you give them your prayers more than you give them your anger? And that goes for anybody, whether it's the governor of this great state or the president of our United States. Are you praying for them more than you talking about them? Are you praying for them more than you're gossiping about them? Well, let me tell you, oh, there's a lot of claps. I wonder if those claps would have still been here if the last president was in. Would we still been clapping? But oh, now you're clapping because somebody else is in there and now you're clapping. I'm just, I'm just asking. Are you praying for those in authority over you? Are you praying for those in authority on a national level, state level, and local level? This is what we're called to do. But I can tell you what you do. You run your mouth and gossip and talk and get on social media and, and, and share videos and, and mess. And, and, and you haven't spent two seconds praying. I, I know you. I know you. I came all the way from Virginia to tell you. So, the last thing, the, uh, verse 9, I, I, I'm leaving out a lot. Uh, then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. Let me stop there. This is where Paul's name, or Saul's name, is officially changed to Paul. This is what I want to leave you with. Saul, his name in Hebrew means requested one, ask for. Paul it is a Greek name, and its name means little. Being a, a dual citizen or being a Roman citizen, he, yes, he had a, a, a Greek name, but he also kept a Hebrew name. So his name Saul means requested one, 
But he also had Paul, which was that Roman name, which means little. Here's the thing. Paul said, no longer do I want to be the requested one, the asked for, the man in demand. I just want to be called little. Paul understood something. The Bible says before honor, there's humility. The Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. The Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due season. This is what I want to leave you with. If you're not being exalted, if you're not being promoted, two things are happening. Either you have not humbled yourself or here's the big one. It's not your season. And I don't want you to be envious or jealous over someone else because it is their season. They don't understand me on this job. They don't appreciate me. And you got your resume out and all over the place and all that kind of stuff. Resume all over the place. Grab that resume. It's just not your season. It's not your season. That's what you need to see. Because either you're not humbling yourself or it's just not your season. One of the two is taking place. Well, I'm just going to go and get me some more education. Then they appreciate me. There's nothing wrong with education, but keep in mind, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 says knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. All knowledge is going to do is puff you up more and think you, how it make you think that I really deserve this job. And I want you to notice something. You remember what happened with King Saul? You remember what God told him through the prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel 15. Watch this. When you were little in your own eyes, I made you king over my people, implying that he was no longer little in his own eyes. Saul had built a monument to himself. And it's not until you see yourself as Paul, as little, that's when God is going to exalt you. When you humble yourself. It's not when you boast about, oh, my job. You know, I was a, a sanitation engineer. <laughs> you were a janitor. <laughs> but you want, you want to exalt yourself. Pump yourself and put stuff on your resume. You know it's not true. It's not there. Not until you humble yourself and see yourself as little, that's when God will exalt you. You don't have to exalt yourself. You don't have to promote yourself. Allow the Lord to promote you. Don't see yourself as Saul, the requested one. See yourself as Paul, little, and God will exalt you and do great things through you. Let me close with this. It's time to go. And many of you know, it's time to go literally. It's time to go. <laughs> but it's time for you to get out of the pew and get in the game. It's time out for the football mentality. 22 people on the field doing all the work and 80,000 in the stands cheering. It's time to get on the field and do the work of God that God has called you to do. It's time for some of you to go on the mission field. Get out of your comf comfy little American lifestyle. Your Southern California ritzy American lifestyle and go to some third world country and hum get humbled. Oh, you'll come back Paul, all right. Little. <laughs> you will. Some of you need to do that. It'll be good for you. But f finally, somebody needs to accept the Lord. That's where you get started. You never pray to accept Jesus Christ to come into your heart. If that's you today, there's a prayer room there. There's a guy there waving. There's some people in there who love to talk to you about these things that we talked about in the Word of God. The way that you know Jesus is in your life, he will affect the way you live. You have a changed life. You cannot have an encounter with the God of the universe and remain the same. Amen. When God comes into your life, he changes you. It makes you like Jesus. If you're not changed, even though you're calling yourself a Christian, you need to go see them in that prayer room. 
and don't leave until there's a change in your life. They'll, be, they'll stick around. And the people you came with will stick around too. They'd be praying, oh, Lord, please change him. <laughs> Father, thank you so much for this great time you've given me to share with this great church. I pray your blessings upon them, your anointing upon them. I pray, God, that you will bless Pastor Jeff and Connie and the staff. Continue to use them to turn this area right side up for you, Lord. Use them, Lord, in a mighty and powerful way. Thank you for this gracious opportunity, Lord, to be here to share your heart with your people. Do a work in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.